So we stay mute for a few minutes. Okay, I think we, we can start. Uh, um, welcome to everybody. Uh, welcome to the speakers. Thank you for having us accepted this invitation. It's a very important topic. Uh, thank you to all the participants that are joining and uh, numerous uh, of participants. This is a very delicate moment uh, for the uh, global economy. Uh, but I have to say that Ireland's economy um, has been even more affected uh, as uh, uh, islands are mainly living of tourism and uh, um, and uh, uh, anyway the tourism is uh, uh, the sector that has been affected even more than other sectors and so um, uh, this is a very important uh, webinar where we try to talk about the island tourism and uh, the pandemic from a global perspective as uh, we understand that the, the problem is global and everybody uh, is affected and we need to be joined. And um, uh, the goal of this webinar, thanks to the presentation, is also to give uh, uh, important e input for the uh, tourism recovery plans that islands are, um, are uh, managing in this moment. So is, uh, uh, we are um, in many parts of the world, um, uh, we are uh, islands are planning to reopen, to restart in the next uh, uh, one, two months and uh, weeks. And, um, and so we need to get prepared. And there is a big, big question mark if we really want to be back as before, or we want to learn from this crisis to be more resilient and to be more environmentally friendly. And uh, I'd like to, uh, before to my uh, short uh, introduction and slide, I'd like to present uh, our um, uh, speakers, uh, George Sonitis from uh, Insular, the Association of the EU Islands Chamber, uh, Chambers of Commerce, and also advisor for the Union of Hellenic Chamber members, a uh, member. And um, we'll talk about the restart, restart tourism in islands after COVID-19 and um, uh, the, 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 then uh, the, we'll have, uh, the, we have the pleasure to have uh, the Vice President of, for uh, Government Affairs, um, Mrs. Lula Unia Cardenas the, of uh, the Global Travel and Tourism Council. We'll talk about the future of travel, a global outlook. And of course, how can we talk about uh, uh, tourism without talking about, uh, uh, anyway, about um, uh, transportation, which is uh, very, very important. So we have uh, the pleasure to have uh, Mr. Dragos uh, um, Muntenu, uh, Europe Assistant Director of Safety and Flight Operations of International Air Transport Association, IATA. 
and we have uh, uh, a global the global uh, representative of the islands government um, Mrs. Kate Brown, um, Executive Director of the Global Island Partnership, uh, that uh, will talk about the lesson learned from early responses and the effort to build back better to, for island tourism. Uh, we have the pleasure to have also Mr. Jeffrey Lipman. Many of you probably will know Mr. Lipman. Uh, very large CV and important rules in the uh, UN WTO in uh, in of course also in uh, WTTC and uh, now president of the International Coalition of Tourism Partners ICTP and president of Sunix Malta. Um, bend our brand climate friendly travel must be, must be the new norm. This is the title of the presentation Mr. Lippmann and uh, uh, George Kremlis, uh, Honorary Director of the European Commission in charge on behalf of the G environment, DG environment of Circular Economy and Islands, uh, will talk about the interrelationship between climate, environment, public health and COVID-19, resilient tourism, the way forward. And uh, um, last but not least, the very important uh, Mr. Milos Momot, Deputy Head of Unit of DG Internal Market Industry Entrepreneurship and SMEs Unit uh, uh, Grow, so DG Grow and uh, Tourism, Textiles and Creative Industries, and is right responsible of the Tourism Division. So after the presentations um, that they will uh, take almost seven minutes each, we will have uh, a round table and the discussion where the uh, panelists will uh, react on, on the presentation of the colleagues. And uh, after that, uh, these 20 minutes, we'll have a session of 20 minutes of Q&A. So the uh, webinar will be closed at uh, uh, um, uh, 3.50. Uh, um, uh, so we we'll last uh, one hour and 50 minutes due to the number of speakers and the importance of the topic. But a very short, um, I'd like to, before to give the floor to speakers, to highlight, uh, uh, let's say, the voice of uh, uh, the result of a survey that we did launch it, uh, a month ago uh, to the, for the island's entrepreneurs, and that really in a few charts, I'd like to highlight uh, the outcomes. Uh, uh, one important question was, uh, do you think that a specific aid package for island businesses should be formulated? And 90% uh, uh, said yes and said uh, we need to move in to a more environmental friendly economy. Um, islands economy is completely dependent on tourism, so the effects are greater and uh, so specific aid are needed. And then funds fund uh, to uh, keep people going until the next summer season means that uh, um, most of the islands will be not open this summer, so, so, so they need to <laughs> survive until the next summers. And uh, uh, I'd like to highlight also uh, the com one comment say we need, a, we need to attract quality tourists. The small islands relying mainly on foreign tourists. So, so this is the situation, dramatic situation now of the islands, maybe an opportunity to restart in a better way. Uh, another question was, do you think that the transition to sustainability of your islands can be strategic? for the relaunch of your business. And uh, of course, uh, as it was expected, almost 86% uh, 80, uh, percent said yes, air purification and hygiene product are, uh, will be the major factor after COVID. It can, be, can um, have a very positive effect on quality tourism, but uh, there is some concern about the um, uh, actions from uh, uh, go, uh, administrators do not take care about environment. So let's uh, give uh, the voice to this input to decision uh, makers. Um, and another comment, uh, there is a lot of interest in remote places now uh, as they are seen as safer. Islands are seen as a safer place where to go in this moment. So let's uh, capitalize on this, as was saying another comment. And this is a great opportunity uh, for bringing new business. And uh, our international guests are very keen to visit islands that adopt sustainable development measures. So maybe a competition will start. 
last uh, chart is uh, uh, to stop the activities due to coronavirus um, as reduce the CO2 emissions and made the sea cleaner everywhere based on this experience. After this time, do you think that people, business and governments should operate more in favor of health and environment? 90% said yes. So we need to go in this direction. This is the voice of entrepreneurs, the result of our survey. So let's go to the agenda and uh, uh, give the floor to the first speaker, uh, George Asonitis, uh, that we did present before from Insular. George, the floor is yours. You can share your presentation, please. George. And put uh, uh, the voice, unmute yourself, please. You cannot start screen share while the other participants... Uh, yes, uh, is, now you can do it. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, thank you, Yanni, and uh, my greetings from uh, sunny Athens. So my uh, presentation is about the start restarting tourism in islands after COVID-19. Uh, and um, my presentation is, uh, I mean, the aim of my presentation is to show that the restart of tourism, particularly in islands, after COVID-19 is not possible uh, by just putting a, a pushing a button. But it is a slow and painful procedure. Uh, I would share my presentation in four parts. The first part is the impact of the crisis on, on tourism in islands. The second, the efforts to restart. The third, the economic and recovery plans. And finally, the key messages. George, can you share your screen, please? Excuse me? Can you share your screen? I did it. Uh, we still don't see. Now? Uh, not yet. Oh, yes, it's coming. It's coming. Okay. Yes. You know, so you can put in uh, presentation mode, please. Okay. Okay. Please. Good. So this is my first slide that you missed. Is I mean to restart tourism is not uh, an easy thing. Uh, the second slide is about I mean the impact uh, of uh, the COVID nineteen in crisis on tourism in islands. Most of the islands uh, worldwide have kept their populations untouched from the pandemic, taking advantage of their isolation. In my knowledge, only uh, Saarema, the, the island of uh, Estonia, uh, half, where half of the population was affected following a volley, uh, volleyball match against a team from Milano, uh, taking place on the 3rd and 4th of March. This is why islands now say that, uh, that uh, they are COVID-free tourist destinations. Uh, the economic and social impact associated with the lockdown of international tourism is likely to be disproportionate for those islands which are the most tourism dependent. You see here, for example, that for seeds, I mean, the, the, the small uh, uh, state island, development state island, I mean, you see Maldives, for example, they are dependent a lot on tourism, 66% of their GDP. In Caribbean islands, tourism accounts for uh, between 34 and 48 of the GDP. Balearic islands is almost 50%, Canary islands 35%, and Ionian islands uh, over 70%. More than 80% of small and medium-sized enterprises in islands are of tourism sector or ECA sector. That means that a loss of the seasonal tourist year will therefore be a disaster for insular economies. Save whatever is possible is the main objective now. Uh, due to the COVID-19 crisis, traditional tour operators 
which in fact played a crucial role for the development of visual regions tourism, have cancelled all contracts, guaranteed and non-guaranteed, signed with local businesses. Moreover, online clients uh, using electronic platforms, as Airbnb, for example, have cancelled reservation to cruise industry, which, is, which for a number of islands is a large source of income, stopped activities without any clear new day to restart yet. At the same time, tour operators request from the uh, local hotels to make significant discounts for the current peak season and to provide them with credit for a period of 60 days after the departure of their customers. Moreover, they seek to include these terms in the contracts to be signed for the year 2000, uh, 2021. Uh, although legal, this attitude is unfair for local businesses, given the huge financial problems they are facing and the additional operating, operating costs they will have from the health measures they will be called upon to implement when they reopen. As a result, many companies doubt if Finally, it is, why to, it is wise to open for this summer in such negative condi conditions. Efforts to restart now. Uh, why may many economy sectors are expected to recover once restrictive measures are lifted, international tourism will probably have a longer lasting effect. The World Trade Organization provided three scenarios of international tourist arrivals based on the gradual opening of travel restriction. So you see here that if we open on July, we have uh, this kind of been, uh, it's 55% minus. The second scenario, if we open in September is minus 70% and in December 78%. Uh, now we'll see the supply chain, the destination chain. Uh, uh, islands need to get out from isolation to reorganize their main activity, tourism, and in long term make the destination resilient. The recovery of the tourism sector should be based on adopting health and safety provisions, training employees from all tourism sectors, building safety and security infrastructure, and disposing of personal protective equipment and hygiene tools. These measures differ from county to country, but all of them add extra burden and cost to local companies. Local companies, in particular Oreca companies, are receiving everyday information regarding travel warnings, ambiguous or contradictory declaration from official of uh, sending countries, or protocols issued by international organizations protocols by tourism association, ASBTTC and IATA, and finally protocols adopted on national level. Meanwhile, national authorities of destinations announce a number of economic measures and advantages to attract international tourists. These measures concern, for example, for example the coverage of healthcare of, re of related costs if travelers are infected by COVID-19 during their holiday at the destination, including their families. This is a really hard competition and the real poker, poker game among competing destinations. From the demand side, a very important condition for the return to normalcy is the real demand, in particular for markets generating outbound tourism for islands. Demand certainly depends not only on the health state of the destination, but uh, also on the health state of the outbound country. The travel directive is in force. Uh, the psychological situation, trust and confidence of the consumers, of the tourists, and the last but not least, the economic situation of consumers. The new concept of staycations, vacations at home, is commonly used by authority of some countries generating outbound tourists. Of course, the demand, can, the demand can be domestic, but is not applicable to all islands. Domestic tourism can contribute 
to some extent to save the year, but it's not a panacea. The same psychology and possibly worse economic. But it's not a panacea. It's not economic. So the expected to affect domestic consumers. Economic recovery plans. Countries with lockdowns have announced assistance and stimulus packages to recover from COVID-19. At member state level, most, most uh, uh, European uh, member states introduced economic assistance packages that would also cover tourism sectors and even nationalization of coronavirus hit companies. I mean, uh, I, I mean, for example, Alitalia was uh, uh, nationalized. Measures included tax moratoriums, extended deadlines for payments of social charges, and wage subsi subsidies, loans, and guarantees for workers. Many of these measures are a form of state aid that usually re requires the Commission's approval. The Commission has stated that it will make sure that state aid can flow to companies that need it. Till today, the Commission has approved, had approved a number of state aid plans. The, United, the EU announced some days ago its proposal for a new recovery tool that will help boost jobs and growth of impacted union economies, named the Next Generation EU. Funding will be invested in supporting EU members with investments and reforms focused on green and digital transitions. Boosting the EU economy by mobilizing private investment to urgently support viable European companies in the sector regions and countries most affected. European islands, which suffer a lot from this crisis and, and uh, which are already planning green and digital transitions, should acquire an equitable part of the stake of this budget. Mr. Asunitis, sorry, you yes. got. Yes, two minutes left for the speech, please. Yes, yes, Thank please. You. Uh, the key message is now, uh, I'm finishing with this slide. I mean, the, first of all, there is no an agreement with coronavirus. How, how long will it stay with us unless a vaccine or an efficient therapy will be discovered? So a first key message is that insular destination is to strengthen local health systems regarding diagnosis and therapies and accessibility to either the reference hospital or repatriation in case of COVID-19. The second concern and goal of local authorities is uh, to promote Thailand as COVID-free destinations and make them resilient. A third issue would be the transformation of existing model of tourism, mass tourism to a, most, a more sustainable and environmentally friendly. Some important destinations with similar models are working hard to change it. For example, Venice, Barcelona, Paris, Amsterdam. Fourth key message, digitalize the economy. Six, no, yes, five message. Is the research, study and implement ideas, suggestions, guidelines, which are published daily, which help islands to take actions, action and decrease possibility of the destination. Sixth message is to create as soon as possible destination management, management organizations, the famous GM, DMOs with a strong task force in crisis management. Seven, reinforce the skills of employees through continuous training. Eight, networking and coordinate common actions between on island and institutions represented islands. Eight, targeting domestic tourism first. Nine, convince European authorities in Brussels to insert insularity clause to all European policies, such as reduce VAT and state aid, as our president Joe Borg, I mean Borg, uh, said during our previous uh, webinar. And last but not least, uh, try to change the model of production for islands, make it more balanced and rich with new concepts and activities such, such as the circular, which uh, is, will be I mean, done by George Kremis, blue and green economy. 
of course, of course, this all this cannot happen of overnight, but needed long strategy and action plans to be decided on the level of each island. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, George Sonitis from Insular. Very important inputs on, uh, on uh, of course, for our strategy. And I hope uh, that from this uh, webinar, we start a cooperation for implementing and feeding the strategy. So I'd like to give the floor now uh, to um, Mrs. Lula Unia Cardenas, Vice President of uh, a Global Travel and Tourism Council. We we'll talk about the future of travel a global outlook. This is Cardenas. Cardenas, you can share your presentation. The, the floor is yours. Hi, can you see the slides? Yes, very well. Great. Let me just, oops, I'm sorry. Can you see them? Yes. Very well. Okay, great. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Yanni and uh, Green in the Islands for inviting WCTC to this important event. We're really honored to be part of, uh, of this uh, excellent uh, panel and uh, having Mr. Liebman uh, on board is really a, an honor and a privilege to be here, especially today when we have uh, World Environment Day, actually so very timing speaking about sustainability and uh, the, the important role that that will play. And, uh, and we're working very closely with Mr. Lippmann on, on different fronts on sustainability. So uh, for those of you who are not very familiar with WTTC, uh, we, are, we were created 30 years uh, ago and um, we actually were created to speak with one voice to 185 uh, countries. Uh, our membership includes 200 uh, CEOs and chairmen of like the most influential companies in the sector. We cover, I mean, airports, airlines, cruise liners, destinations, uh, GDSs, uh, from the most really disrupting ones, so the traditional ones, hotels, tour operators, and um, and so what we actually we're very balanced also the the membership with 30 percent which represent europe 30 percent of the membership uh, is in the in the americas 30 percent in asia and the 10 percent in in the rest of the world so um what we do uh, backbone to what we do is really we uh, do research on the economic impacts that the sector actually has on the gdp of countries and with that we go to governments to actually reinforce the importance of the sector in the economy but not only uh, also on jobs. So like last year, uh, 2019 was an extraordinary year, as we know. I mean, that it was a, a very successful year. And, uh, and so 10.3% uh, uh, of global GDP. But in more, for the ninth consecutive year, we have outpaced uh, global economy. And uh, the more important thing is the employment. The sector employs one out of 10 uh, jobs in the planet. And a figure I want you to stay with today is actually like last year, one out of four jobs in all sectors were actually created in ours. Now we also uh, have a spread of like uh, international versus domestic. Uh, we, George spoke about domestic probably the first phase and of restarting uh, after the pandemic. And uh, certainly uh, you know, that will have uh, a role to play in, in many regions, probably for islands, as we saw, like domestics may be this important, so that, that will be still a, a challenge. Now, uh, we also have a spread of uh, business um, versus leisure. Now, um, these are figures, of course, before COVID uh, came to our lives, and uh, and so this uh, showcases a little bit of like the impact that it has had so far on, on the sector. This has changed from the beginning until now quite substantially. Uh, we started with 50, um, you know, the, an impact of like an estimation of 50 million job losses. And so we are now at doubled that figure. So 100.8 million job losses, um, you know, a decrease of 30% in GDP. And this is actually, we say, five times the 2008 uh, financial crisis. So uh, now uh, I'm President in times, uh, of course, but at the same time, we, we still think we need to learn from the past and uh, what we 
could take from a previous uh, uh, previous crisis. As you know, um, WTTC, one of the work we do is actually uh, crisis management and recovery. That has been really core to us uh, as well and it's been on our agenda for uh, quite some time. And of course, uh, our sector is uh, probably affects everything in our sector and uh, it's impacted by many crises. It is true that it's a very resilient uh, sector, so we, we recover. But uh, and that's a very good news, probably. And in November last year, we actually launched, um, without knowing what was coming, uh, a crisis report. And uh, there we looked at uh, 90 different crises for the past uh, 90, 20 years. And so it showed a little bit of like uh, the average that uh, recovery uh, has had. So the average of recovery uh, has decreased in the past 10 years. And so uh, for terrorism and security, of course, uh, any event related to, to that, the average recovery time was of like 11 months and now it has reduced to two. Uh, political instability probably is the, still the mother of all crises. We saw that in Hong Kong, in Barcelona, and that also has halved like from 20 months to, to 10 months. And then of course, we also look at outbreaks and uh, in a worst case scenario, it used to be nearly 20 months and now it, uh, it has uh, reduced to, to 10 as well. So um, we still hope that uh, that will be the case with, uh, with this situation. Uh, now, in, in, the, you know, in a positive scenario, when the right measures uh, are taken, governments take good measures, you know, we, that showcases that actually that recovery period can be reduced and uh, we always recover but uh, you know we need to learn from the past and we had 9-11 for example and uh, it took it took us four years to recover from that global impact and so uh, we still have different uh, protocols at airports globally and so there was a lack of coordination of course security was at, at heart but uh, there was a lack of private public coordination maybe 2008 uh, there for example that's actually a great lecture uh, in, a, in a fast recovery there we had the g20 platform put in place discuss with the private sector and, uh, and and so define what to do and when so it took 18 months uh, to recover from the financial crisis and, uh, you know, we have other outbreaks, of course, uh, where we didn't have a vaccine and we still we restarted travel. Obviously, they're different to the, the one we are facing right now, but, uh, you know, isolating sick people, etc. So to recover uh, faster, we have been advocating and uh, talking about like four key principles on like uh, and number one, as I said, it's like, okay, we have, we have been calling governments for a coordinated approach uh, to remove uh, barriers, to reopen borders. And, and so we, you know, if there is no re coordination, recovery will last longer. So we are actually calling on governments to really uh, the G20, we participated at the G20, the extraordinary meeting that they did, and uh, it's uh, Saudi Arabia is the host now, and uh, and then we were really calling to remove barriers. Latest uh, UK having a two-week quarantine, and so we are calling also the UK government to put quarantines down. Maybe it makes sense at the beginning when the restrictions were up, the first weeks, the first months, but uh, now that countries are actually opening up and uh, lifting restrictions probably put these countries in an uncompetitive uh, advantage as well. So we have been calling for removing barriers on, on that front as well. Now, number two, technology. And uh, liaise with the private sector, see what's out there, what are they suggesting? And, and so what are the solutions that we are having? We see these in two phases. We see, of course, before the vaccine and after the vaccine, obviously. So before the vaccine, we need to, of course, uh, put forward protocols to reduce risk, but you know that we are very, uh, you know, uh, supportive of the testing and contact tracing, for example. Again, we're thinking about a seamless traveler journey experience. And uh, there we have also been working at WTTC on, on biometrics and uh, probably they are going to have a stronger role to play uh, because uh, of the, the use of biometrics at airports, for example, everything that, that reduces the physical contact, so touchless. Mrs. And, uh, Sorry, Mrs. Unyaka, Dennis, 
you know, just um, one minute left for your presentation. Okay, thank you. great. Uh, Harry, and thank you. And, uh, and so, of course, we continue asking for support from governments and uh, we are calling them measures to help financially the, the industry, the sector, and uh, not only now, but also afterwards, it's going to be like a, a long recovery and protocols. And that leads me to my very last slide. And, uh, and it's called protocols we just launched in May. Uh, safe travels uh, hashtag and so together with uh, our members governments and uh, of course with who and a number of like international organizations we've uh, put together we we have now a basic baseline uh, protocols for hospitality aviation and airports uh, tour operators mice and so events and uh, one objective is to really rebuild traveler trust and confidence and uh, and so that's what we do we've been of course using the expertise from our hotelier members for example that were hospitals so they're really high up in the you know health protocol that they have been putting in place now we've developed this safe travel screen stamp uh, so that there is a, an identification to recognize those uh, that uh, have implemented the, the protocols and we have now many destinations and many countries calling and asking for uh, endorsing uh, this, this safe uh, travel stamp. UNWTO, which is the UN uh, branch for tourism from the United Nations, has also endorsed the, the stamp and, and the protocols. And lastly, to conclude, I, I would like to mention that, you know, uh, the trend we are seeing, and George referred to this as well, we see three phases. It's, uh, of course, it's going to play a very important role. Uh, eventually going, uh, you know, regional travel. Buscando visitar y fases of domestic kids at the hotel and being. Hello? Please go ahead. I don't know what was the noise. Please. Um, I don't know what happened. Sorry. And uh, and so regional, and then of course, like the, the third stage would be like the, you know, at the last stance, the, the long uh, haul travel. Now, governments seem to be looking now at uh, at these bubbles we are listing, or these like green or safe corridors. And uh, so we see that they are taking into consideration the health component, the political alignment or will uh, to actually restart uh, business as well, and uh, the, the tourism factor linked to the source market that these countries are having for years. Globally, we have Australia and New Zealand bubble that is going to be adding in up through a other uh, other countries, uh, you know, like Indonesia, South Korea, or Singapore, we have as well the China, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, and then we have we're seeing also like some bubbles or some corridors being created in Europe, like the Baltic states uh, having one, maybe including Finland and Poland, the southern uh, countries as well. So we are really working closely with destinations and, and governments to try to see how to accelerate maybe these corridors to start uh, at some point and and so we're trying to advocate whenever we can for uh to get a, a faster recovery so uh i think i'll stop here before uh, and uh, and so count on our support and i thank you very much thank you very much uh, a lot uh, with mrs uh, cadenas very interesting presentation and i like your words uh, we need to rebuild trust uh, and uh, uh, of course following the protocol coordination will uh, make uh, the recovery faster and we need to learn from the past uh, and um, and uh, very nice message and a lot of input from your side so now is um, the time of uh, of yata of mrs uh, um, dragos uh, Muntenu um, and uh, IATA views on restarting air operations. So the floor is yours. Um, please, uh, you can share your presentation. Hello, good afternoon. Um, do you see my, my slides? Did I manage to, to share yeah, my screen? You, you can put in, yes, in uh, presentation mode. It, in, it is in presentation mode now. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good day. Thank you very much for the invitation in um, talking to you a little bit on how air transport has been hit and how IATA, the International Air Transport Association, is trying together with its members to basically start operations and go back to the new normality. 
So uh, what we uh, what we see now is that the challenge for us will be to to restart aviation, protecting health and safety, and ensuring that basically air transport is not a, a vector to uh, to further propagate the the COVID, but then also restoring the confidence of the passengers in uh, into air transportation. And then clearly we need to uh, to understand that there will be some temporary measures that we all need to take in order to uh, to basically continue flying. What would be our goal? Well, again, the goal is to restore air connectivity. Today we are at the, uh, even less than 10% of air travel, of uh, air transportation to, the, to comparing to a normal year, like for instance, 2019 was. So you see uh, a lot of airplanes not flying anymore, being parked and a lot of people, uh, a lot of jobs being threatened. So what we need for that will, will be an internationally consistent, mutually accepted and harmonized way. We are a global industry. We cannot have piecemeal approaches and national differences, which will make air travel uh, virtually impossible. We've been always been uh, wanting and needing international standards, international practices. Of course, we've been working with the uh, global uh, body of uh, civil aviation, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization, and they have recently uh, uh, produced a document. It's, card, it's called the CARD report or the takeoff, the takeoff report, which in fact establishes the principles and gives a lot of steps on how we view the continuation and, and the success of restarting uh, air travel while still coping with the, with the pandemic. In terms of aviation, uh, of course, we are a major contributor to the global GDP, drives economies, uh, creates an employment. We, uh, we know that around more than 65 million jobs are in fact linked to, uh, to aviation. Regarding trade, and you have seen that air cargo has continued to be um, the, the link between our, our countries still in this period. 35% of global goods uh, are being transported by air. Every year, uh, a lot of the uh, healthcare equipment has been transported on board of, uh, of aircraft still in this and the aviation connect all businesses and have, uh, have let's say, a there are risks, but uh, aviation has been traditionally very, uh, very well equipped to, to deal with risks. We see that these risks can be mitigated. There is no silver bullet. So we believe in a layered approach at various stages in order to basically reduce the, the risk of infection to, to the minimum. So there is no single prescriptive solution. How we would like to proceed, there will be some, some guiding principles that, that we would like to see that uh, everybody abides for. For instance, these measures that we are introducing have to be uh, up, as upstream as possible. We cannot think that the, the, message, the, the, the measure should be only on board of the aircraft. So throughout the transportation journey, there will be certain steps to be, to be taken. It is critical that governments cooperate with the industry. It is extremely important that this is uh, that the industry is not left alone. Uh, basically, governments understand that they need to play a role. The measure should not be take should not last forever. If the uh, the situation will improve, we need to be able to to remove some of these measures. And again, the roles and responsibilities of governments and of, of each player in this field is extremely important to, uh, to be taken care of. And I will, um, I will take you to basically some examples of what are these measures that basically the industry together with the governments and regulators have been thinking of. And on this slide, you see typically your, your travel starting from home and from home until you reach your home at the end at the end uh, uh, the other end of your journey or your hotel or your tra travel destination, you'll have to take some steps. For instance, in terms of pre-flight, there will be some information that from passengers will need to be collected, basically your contact details. You know that basically one way of fighting these pandemics is contact tracing. So basically that's an information that can be collected in an electronic format starting from, from your home. Check-in. Uh, more, more and more, we, be, we have been doing electronic checking, and we are, I think, quite accustomed to be to uh, basically have a boarding pass or even a baggage tag from your home that you can print at home. You have on your mobile. This will grow, and this, in fact, will alleviate the um, the, the personal contacts at the um, at the at the airport. 
once you reach the airport, there will be some some steps to be taken. Uh, we believe that the terminal access will be minimized to basically passengers and the, the staff that needs to work in the airport. In certain airports, depending on national measures, there will be temperature screening and entry uh, in the airport. Physical distancing, and there's been a lot of discussion about physical distancing, of course, where the infrastructure allows physical distancing is a very good uh, principle to be aligned with the, with the local rules. Masks and personal protective equipment, we see it daily today in airports and of course throughout the, the, air, the air travel, we will see masks and face coverings more and more. And of course, in the airport, you will have various points where you can in fact disinfect your, your hands. The airport processes, a lot of them are already uh, not involving a contact with the person. So basically you have kiosks, you have the way to, to uh, tag your baggage and to in fact check in your, your heavy luggage without an interaction with the person. That technology helps and we, we hope that it will help even, even further. In terms of boarding, boarding in most of the airports is becoming again an, an electronic process in which you scan your boarding pass, in which you scan yourself, your, um, your mobile phone without the interaction of a person and then over there physical distancing depending on the infrastructure will be, uh, will be, will be very helpful. Then of course uh, cabin, uh, cabin baggage is always uh, an issue. We believe that reducing the, the amount and the number of pieces will alleviate a little bit the fact that the boarding will take longer. So that's something that, that we see happening. In terms of in-flight, uh, there are... Sorry, sir. To... Excuse me. Yes, in, I'm finishing. Yeah, the last in, two minutes, thank you. In two minutes. So we, we've reached the in-flight portion of the flight. Um, aircraft, luckily, are equipped with very, very performant filtration system, we call it the HEPA filters. That is, an, uh, is, a, is a, in fact, a reason why we don't see, we haven't seen a significant number of infections on board of the aircraft. The fact that passengers are not sitting face to face is also very helpful. On board, we see face masks being, uh, being used by everybody on board, and then the service on board might be limited at the beginning, and then using a lot of, uh, of the disinfection uh, uh, processes and procedures. At the arrival airport, uh, the minimization of, of, of contacts and making use of the whole infrastructure in order to minimize contact to, uh, with other persons uh, will be the same principles that, that need to be taken. Um, of course, uh, in terms of security, in terms of border processing, we also believe that the technology will help a lot in alleviating the, the, the potential for um, close human contact. And I'm reaching basically the, the, the last slide. The conclusion is that we don't have today one single measure that can mitigate all the biosafety risks of travel, but we believe that this range of measures that I have mentioned, and there are many others which are being highlighted by us and by, the, uh, by, by ICAO, those measures are achievable and uh, they, they already exist. Of course, working together with governments and regulators is the only way we can um, we can see air travel going forward. And of course, if a vaccine will come, if uh, very rapid testing or electronic immunity passports will come to be, of course, those will be uh, an areas to, uh, to invest in the future and hopefully make travel even, even more smoother. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. A very interesting presentation with, uh, uh, of course, uh, with the important messages. Uh, um, anyway, the interesting to uh, learn that uh, uh, the upstream measures are really, really important. And uh, anyway, uh, on board uh, in the planes, uh, passengers are uh, maybe safer than uh, that can be outside if there are not the proper measures. And uh, cooperation uh, with companies is very important. And uh, yes, so so thank you very much. And uh, uh, the invitation, of course, is also. Um, Yata to join in this path to sustainability as the plane, of course, uh, need to play their role in, in that uh, direction. Uh, very, very important. And um, now uh, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Mrs. Uh, Kate Brown, Executive Director of Global Island Partnership. Uh, um, so, lesson learned from early responsive responses and effort to build back better for island tourism. Very interesting. We don't want to be back as before, no, uh, Mr. <laughs> and Mrs. Uh, Brown? The floor is yours. No, thank you very much, Jenny. 
Thank you so much. Um, and it's great uh, to be here. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'm actually talking uh, on behalf of um, two organizations. One is the Global Island Partnership and the other is an organization that we started um, last year called the Local 2030 Islands Network. Well, it's more of a network, which the Global Island Partnership is also the secretariat for. Um, the Global Island Partnership is really focused on uh, mobilizing political leadership, um, identifying bright spots, mobilizing commitment and collaboration around sustainability and conservation. And the Local Islands Network is focused on uh, supporting early leader islands on um, who are trying to implement the sustainable development goals at a local level. So those are the kind of two things. One of the things we did um, in the last couple of months with the advent of COVID-19 is really think about how we could be helpful in much the same way as uh, Greening the Islands has. And we've been convening a series of webinars also um, kind of globally with a lot of islands. Um, and our first one was actually on sustainable tourism. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about now are kind of some of the messages that came out of um, that discussion and also um, back and forth input. And so on that first webinar, we actually had uh, about more than 400 participants in the, in the webinar, but we had a Hawaii Tourism Authority, the Philippines, Cook Islands, Curacao, Galapagos, and a tourism researcher from Hawaii uh, who kind of joined our um, panel. And I'll talk a little bit about um, where we went to in that. And a lot of that was thinking about um, what the opportunity, um, kind of both being aware of the importance of tourism to islands all over the world. And I live in New Zealand. Um, tourism is really important to us here in New Zealand. If there's one thing that's on the radio every single day, for like the last two months. It's about the tourism economy and what we're going to do. So it's kind of very front of mind. Um, so one of the things um, with our local 2030 Islands Network is very focused on the SDGs. As I said, uh, a couple of months ago, the UN Secretary General released a report um, on the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19. And in that, he really highlighted um, the the importance of that agenda on 2030, the 2030 agenda and the SDGs as a roadmap for trying to build back um, better and using that kind of concept of building back better um, as a way to strengthen resilience um, over the long term. So a lot of this thinking is about um, how we move from where we are now and a lot of um, even all of these islands um, that we had kind of engaged in our webinar, this is the space they're in. They're thinking about how do they utilize this moment um, and the real difficulty and pain that they're going through to do things differently in the future. Um, and so it kind of aligns very much with um, where the discussion is at the global level. Um, and I think in the webinars that we've been kind of doing, we've been looking very much at the short term, what is happening um, right now, how are people are responding um, to what is in many ways an emergency, then what are, what are people looking at in the medium term and then obviously in the longer term. But I think all of this, there's so much uncertainty, no one really has the answers. None of us on this webinar have really um, as much certainty as anyone would like to have as we move forward. So, but what, what people have really um, put forward is that we need, um, we need to move forward, forward purposefully in a way that benefits um, island people. And I think that's really critical. So in the short term, it's kind of looking at things like health impacts and socioeconomic issues, all the people that lose their jobs and have no source of income. Um, one of the real um, things that had became really clear both in the tourism webinar and subsequent ones is the importance of food security in island space. Um, over the medium term, there was more discussion about the when it is safe to reopen. And again, you'll see there's some islands that are reopening right now and others are pushing it further into the distance. Um, even in New Zealand with the bubble concept with Australia, it's not that popular with the public. Um, reopening to Australia. So even though that is one of our main tourism markets, there's um, the complexity of how people feel in terms of their vulnerability 
to um, those types of decisions. Um, and then there was real push in all of these discussions about making sure that islands that have access to financial, technical and political support and that their issues aren't kind of forgotten as we focus on bigger countries um, and places that have more complex problems um, underway right now. And then over the longer term, this opportunity to try and increase economic resilience and also the awareness that we have future disruptions coming um, towards us, both from climate change impacts and also um, the thinking that there will be another pandemic. So we know we need to do this. Um, and in terms of what that looks like, and move my, I have this, thank you. Um, it's really the idea of moving beyond our current challenges around overdevelopment. I think some of our speakers touched on that maybe at the start. Um, dislocation and inequalities among local residents. A lot of the messaging that came about was about the, the impact of tourism on local island communities and how that can be um, turned around a little bit. Um, and then how we can support island efforts to achieve their sustainable development goals. So a lot of islands that we work with are um, trying to look at tourism as an issue amongst a whole range of issues from energy to waste to, to uh, agriculture, um, not tourism on its own. And that was really important message coming through. And then there was a real feeling that tourism can be a tool for social regeneration um, in an island context. In terms of um, the strategies for more innovative, diverse, competitive, sustainable island economies, that was really kind of a clear messaging. Um, the, some of the strategies that have been put forward um, and that were coming through as messaging and what we're taking away from um, our work is the need to promote more responsible tourism guided by human and traditional values focused on the interests of citizens. So it's kind of switching um, the tourism space in many islands um, from what it is right now. Uh, the importance of partnering between residents, local tourism businesses and tourists in this whole process of thinking about what building back better looks like and how we move powerfully forward into the future. Um, again, community engagement and tourism related decisions. And um, for some islands that are very heavily tourism dependent, there was a real there's been a lot of thinking about economic diversification so that they're not so dependent on tourism, but tourism is part of um, their economic um, space, but not kind of the main thing. And that was looking at kind of innovation, some redesign of tourism experiences. Um, and there were some great examples shared on that. Looking at um, kind of developing export economies and um, training and diversification of skills. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Brown, sorry, just to remind you about the last two minutes. Thank you. Perfect. I'm nearly there. Um, and I think looking at um, the opportunities of um, around the digital economy, there's a lot of talk about that in the tourism space, so, um, which was seen as really important. And then um, also looking at how we identify and realize opportunities to support sustainability that is looking at shared value and benefits to the tourism sector. So around things like waste management, um, culturally authentic tourist experiences, <clears throat> um, ecotourism, energy efficient transitions, and um, the importance of linking local agriculture to the tourism industry in ways that promote food security. And we're seeing this um, discussion happening a lot in uh, many islands um, around how to actually do this. Um, and there's, at the same time, there's been quite a big investment in um, local agriculture in many islands as a kind of food security measure in the short and medium term to deal with people without um, incomes. So it's um, kind of interesting to see these issues really linked. And I think it points to why the importance of kind of looking at uh, the issue of tourism in this kind of uh, more linked way. And um, that's all. But I actually just wanted to say one last thing. I think <clears throat> just on the on the point of opening up, I think there's some um, real diversity of opinion on um, that. And I, I, it's going to be interesting to see. I think that um, because quite large parts of the world, in particular large parts of the world that have 
uh, of a quite uh, important tourism markets have not really addressed COVID-19 as well as they could. I actually think that's going to make this opening up process quite difficult. Um, but as I said, we're really interested to support um, this process and also anyone that wants to kind of look at it from the building back better space. So thank you very much. Uh, Gianni, I think you're muted. Yes, uh, very, uh, okay, now you listen to me, sorry. Um, so thank you, uh, Kate, for your input. Uh, uh, very important, your point of uh, the need from, uh, anyway, uh, you, you represent the island's government, and of course you need to be, uh, to focus on the resilience of your islands, uh, economic diversification is, is very important, and um, innovation as a, another, another topic that could be added uh, anyway uh, as a, uh, an economy that could be uh, also uh, support the island's uh, diversification. And uh, very important, your input on short, medium, long term, uh, and uh, anyway, building back, uh, back better. And um, yes, a lot of uh, input, and I'm sure the other speakers will react on, on your point uh, during the, 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 um, the round, uh, round table. So I'd like, as time is running, um, so I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Professor, um, Professor uh, Lippmann. Uh, I'm, it seems that, uh, anyway, everybody, of course, uh, knows uh, uh, Professor Lippmann for the long, long experience in the tourism and different organizations. And um, uh, Professor Lippmann, uh, the floor is yours. Please, I give you the floor. I just show one slide that you sent me and then a short video. Um, so a few minutes of uh, discussion and, and presentation, then I will, when you um, I will start the video that you send us afterwards, please. Thank you very much, Gianni. And um, also thank you, Lola, for your nice words at the beginning. Um, I think the reason why people know me is because I'm getting very old. <laughs> and um, it gives me the license to not produce any slides for this. I, I simply think that um, we're tending to get uh, webinared out and PowerPointed out and, and losing sight of some of the essentials. Um, I, I'm not really going to speak about COVID-19 at any length. I'm just going to uh, make a couple of comments about it. The virus doesn't attend seminars. We will do in the short term, I believe, what the virus makes us do. And we have to have a, a difference in our mind about what we would like to happen and what may in fact be a reality. If society, and not tourism, not islands, but society as a whole, opens up too quickly, we will have a second peak and the consequences in socioeconomic terms will be much more significant than if our leaders manage to hold a line and keep some containment. And the ultimate, um, the ultimate, um, sorry, the, the ultimate test, of course, is when we get a vaccine. There will be a world before a vaccine and a world, and a world after a vaccine. But getting a vaccine is not going to mean that there'll be a global solution. You have to produce it, deploy it, test it. You have to get people to have their contacts followed. And in these circumstances, my, my projection, and my guess is as good as anybody else's on this seminar, and as bad, is that it's going to take at least 18 months before there's any sign of anything that we can call normalcy. And it's, despite, Lola, all of the 90 crises that you looked at, there's a difference between a, an epidemic, a pandemic in this case, and one where there's huge pressures to reopen when many, many people are looking in the mirror and saying, yeah, but I don't really want to travel. Travel is, unfortunately, travel and islands come together 
at the epicenter of this problem because so many islands have have put their future behind travel um, the plant is built on the seashore which we know is 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 going to be at risk when you have hurricanes and 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 um, tsunamis and all of those sort of things and the economies as I think you mentioned at the beginning, Gianni, there are a significantly higher portion of GDP than of, of other countries. Um, so in the short term, it's going to be, in my view, a question of hold tight, keep costs low, and use the mechanisms that governments are putting in place, particularly the EU, who I think is, is being incredibly strong in this area, um, to provide job security and livelihoods, um, even while we know, and I, I look uh, at IATA here, I look at WTTC, the organizations are developing protocols and approaches that will help individual places make their individual decisions because they've got to be this, where they balance their situation, their socioeconomic conditions against the ultimate issue, which is the health condition. So that's just a, an introduction. I'm actually going to talk about something totally different. Um, I'm going to talk about climate change. I'm going to talk about the uh, importance of being able to walk and chew gum at the same time, because this crisis has not eliminated what has been a much more significant crisis in the long term. Climate change is existential. I repeat that, existential. If we don't fix that, everything else that we do in the short term is rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. And we, we know that we have to fix it. We know how to fix it. And I believe islands have a very important part to play, a little bit uh, based on the the comment that I think it was Kate made, but um, you will need to think in terms of how do we deal with the present whilst re-establishing our, our economies for the, for the future. We need to be um, much more responsive to the climate than other places need to be. So with that, um, it's World Environment Day today. I wish you a happy World Environment Day. I wish it was a happier one. Um, we have today launched with WTTC a social media campaign called Bend Our Trend. Um, and we're very pleased to be doing it with WTTC. We've, we've been working with them on climate issues for, for the past 12 months in a, in, and very positively. And, and, and let me be clear, uh, WTTC and Gloria Guevara has taken a lead on this issue and, and has recognized how important it is for travel and tourism to get into the mainstream of global response on an issue which is when, if, if we let this get out of hand, th this will be like the pandemic on steroids. Just think of the forest fires in, in Australia, Think of the, the hurricanes in the Caribbean. Uh, think of the climate refugees coming to Europe from Africa. And this is, this is not a, a possible further crisis like another pandemic. This is real world. So if you could show this 90 second video, and then I'd like to make a few comments about what we are doing at Sunex Malta which is a collaboration between a not-for-profit that I created with Maurice Strong, the father of sustainable development, uh, 10 years ago, and the government of Malta, which is, which is a small island and which has played an incredible role in putting climate change on the UN Assembly agenda in 1988, and whose Minister of Tourism and Consumer Protection, uh, Julia um, Portelli, is committed to making Malta a centre of climate-friendly travel. And if you'd like to play the video, if, if you can make that happen. Yes. 
climate crisis remains unchanged by COVID-19. It is existential. The 2015 Paris Agreement says everyone must dramatically reduce carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions towards zero by 2050. Starting now, travel and tourism is a tenth of the world economy. With a seriously growing carbon footprint, we are threatening the lives of our kids and grandkids unless we bend this trend. At Cenex Malta, we believe we can do this with climate-friendly travel. One, lowering our carbon footprint. Two, growing green through the Sustainable Development Goals. Three, tying ourselves to the Paris 1.5 degree climate neutral targets. We have introduced five support tools to help companies and communities bend the trend. First, a registry of climate neutral ambitions to serve as a strategic discipline and visibility vehicle. Second, a database of good practice to provide inspiration. Third, online support for transformation. Fourth, a new diploma in climate friendly travel for next generation leaders. Fifth, visibility and green marketing through SDG 17 partners. So why don't you work with us at SunX Malta to bend the trend together? Just go to www.thesunprogram.com and let's get started. Yes. Please, Mr. Yeah. Mitchell. Thank you. I, I showed the video because it saves me making the points uh, at length. So I'll just make them very briefly. Um, this is real. This is existential. The world has developed a solution in the Paris agreements. We are talking about it with lots of work going on about it. Um, the airlines have been working in IKEA on it. Hotels are individually doing things. Um, it's not enough. We're not going far enough, fast enough. And like so many things, our sector is talking a wonderful game, but lagging behind. And this campaign we've started and the registry that we're putting in place is designed to make people understand that you can't put this aside whilst you deal with the the real challenges, the, the human challenges of the current situation. You have to be able to do the two things at once. We've introduced a concept called climate friendly travel. You saw the reference there. It's very simple. You have to make strategic plans, companies and communities, to reduce their carbon to zero by 2050. And I look at IATA here, the ambition of the airlines is unfortunately far too conservative, developed 10 years ago, needed to be updated, needs to find a safe aviation fuel which doesn't produce carbon. Islands are too dependent on flying not to get behind that drive. It needs to use the SDGs. Mr. Mr. Lippmann, sorry. Yeah. We need to end this. Yes, we need to end the speech. Thank you. It needs to use the SDGs to go green over the next 10, 15, 20 years, and it needs to tie itself to the Paris 1.5 agreement. And we've introduced that series of tools in Malta, which are designed using web to, to give people support as they shift their own strategies to climate-friendly travel. That's what we're calling it. We think it's a license to grow. If we don't fix this, Tomorrow's generation are telling us they're not going to fly, they're not going to contribute to their own deaths. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lippmann, for these uh, important messages. Invitation also to Yata to join the club uh, to make uh, islands uh, and uh, the world, the, the tourism around islands greener. And uh, there will be the time of a debate afterwards. So, uh, time is running. I'd like to give the floor now to Mr. George Kremlis, uh, uh, from um, Honorary Director of the European Commission in charge uh, on, behalf, on behalf of uh, the G Environment of Circular Economy of Islands, the inter international in inter relationship between climate, environment, public health, and COVID 19 resilient tourism, the way forward. George, the floor is yours, please. You can share your presentation. Thank you, Gianni. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I wish you all a happy World Environment Day. 
which we are celebrating today. A, a clean and a healthy environment is a prerequisite for a sustainable uh, tourism as uh, COVID-19 has illustrated the link between uh, climate change, environmental degradation, public health and the quality of life. And this chain is extremely important for a healthy and sustainable uh, tourism where all the stages of the chain have to be uh, safe and healthy and uh, COVID uh, resilient as uh, we need to promote at the end of the day a COVID resilient uh, tourism. Now, as uh, presented by previous speaker, this starts from the country of origin, which needs to be COVID free or to a large extent COVID free. Then the transport means, then uh, the country uh, where the tourist arrives and then the hotel. And uh, this is a very uh, important uh, chain that uh, we need, uh, we need uh, to preserve. Now, islands as uh, uh, tourism destinations are more vulnerable uh, to climate change. Uh, they are threatened by extreme weather phenomena. The sea level rises. They have problems of coastal erosion, uh, problems of uh, uh, saline water intrusion, and of course, uh, water scarcity. And therefore, creating a, a health and a healthy and safe environment on the island is extremely important to ensure on the one hand that public health uh, conditions uh, will be available and that the tourists will enjoy a quality of life in uh, a safe and healthy environment. Uh, islands are also more vulnerable to pandemics because uh, they can be threatened, although they were protected and they have suffered less than the mainland, they could be threatened by, uh, by tourists that could bring uh, the COVID uh, to, to the island. And this is linked also to the insularity handicap because uh, islands have insufficient public health uh, services. So if a uh, pandemic happens on an island, it is very difficult uh, to cope with it. And of course, the, the patients will have to be transport, transport, transported to the mainland uh, uh, by special means, including helicopters, which makes uh, the cost uh, very high. And probably an idea would be to ensure that uh, the tourists that visit another country, and in particular islands, have a health insurance package that ensures that in case they are affected, they can be transported to the mainland or to their own country uh, to uh, benefit uh, from the appropriate, uh, let's say, uh, health uh, services. And of course, uh, as I was mentioning before, environmental declaration and climate change can lead uh, to pandemics because uh, uh, atmospheric pollution, for example, can be a vector uh, to disseminate uh, uh, the virus uh, and uh, the, uh, the warming uh, and changes uh, uh, and weather climate, uh, extreme weather climate uh, conditions with the melting of the icebergs and the Antarctic uh, can uh, lead uh, to the appearance of new viruses from which uh, the humanity can uh, suffer. Therefore, we need to promote uh, resilient tourism, both, as I was mentioning before, at the destination and I'm proud to say that Greece, my country, is a COVID resilient uh, tourism destination. And of course, at the resort where the, uh, the tourists uh, will, be, uh, will, be, uh, will be hosted. Now, these are uh, some ideas which I will not necessarily share with you as uh, they will be posted on the website of um, uh, of uh, journey of uh, greening uh, the islands. What is important is uh, to ensure a non-toxic environment at the hotel, uh, climate change mitigation measures, renewables, which are extremely important to reduce the emissions and uh, climate change, energy saving uh, through renewables, and the use of appropriate materials to make the buildings uh, bio, bioclimatic and uh, 
to ensure that uh, the, uh, for example, air conditioning uh, uh, conditions are proper uh, to avoid the dissemination of uh, uh, the, the COVID in case uh, uh, somebody suffers uh, from it. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we need also to take into consideration all the other uh, weather conditions uh, on, on the island uh, where the hotels uh, are located uh, to ensure that uh, the best possible uh, climate uh, neutral and uh, environmental healthy conditions uh, appear. Now, there are other considerations, noise, uh, water resources, the quality of uh, drinking water, how grey water is managed, the protection of the water quality, and of course, the uh, protection of the beaches and the bathing water's quality are extremely important, as well as the protection of the biodiversity and uh, the, uh, the ecosystem services that are extremely important for the ecological equilibrium of uh, uh, the country of uh, destination. Uh, other ideas uh, refer to uh, the feeling of security uh, for tourists in relation to uh, civil protection, which is an extremely important consideration uh, to be taken uh, on board. And then last but not least, as it was mentioned by others, including by Gianni at the very beginning, we need to promote a quality tourism. The must uh, tourism, over tourism, is a phenomenon from which destinations suffer, the environment suffers. Therefore, the COVID uh, pandemics uh, have given us, uh, let's say, uh, some lessons uh, from which we can learn to uh, promote, uh, let's say, new forms of uh, sustainable tourism, and I would say circular tourism, with uh, circular economy plans uh, for the islands, combined with uh, digital economy uh, consideration, which are extremely important. Uh, two last points, the uh, recovery plan that was recently adopted uh, by the European Commission and will be hopefully adopted uh, very soon is extremely important for the islands of the European Union and for tourism in general, as it can support uh, all forms uh, of uh, clean uh, and healthy tourism and the appropriate infrastructure, including a digital infrastructure. Therefore, recovery plans should be prepared both at the national level, but also at the level of each island, together with circular economy plans per island, combined also with the climate adaptation plans that each island needs to have. Another good news is that the Just Transition Fund, and we were discussing uh, this uh, journey during our last uh, uh, digital event, will now cover also islands and the clean energy islands will be covered by the Just Transition Fund, and therefore uh, the idea of... Uh, Sorry, Mr. Kremlis. Two minutes, two minutes or one minute? Le just less than two minutes. <laughs> okay. I'm almost, just, yes, I'm almost please. There. Therefore, we can also benefit uh, from the Just Transition Fund and present uh, something which will promote further with European Union financing the clean energy islands to avoid uh, using uh, uh, sources of energy, fossil fuels, for example, and promote renewable sources uh, of, of energy. I think the challenges are very big. We have now all the financial means within the European Union. We have the ideas. And here, this is the last overhead you have in front of you the next event in which also Gianni will be participating. I will have the pleasure to be the moderator on COVID-19 and now chance for cleaner energy and climate neutrality, including on the islands. Therefore, there are important interactions with a view to our big event, which will be a digital one and which will be the circle of the mat between 9 and 13 of November, where all of you are most welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, George. Uh, very important input, uh, of course, on circular economy and the link uh, 
anyway of the 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 energy water mobility waste uh, with the tourism um, which is very important and uh, and uh, very uh, I like the, 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 that we talk about circular economy also in the tourism sector. Um, and uh, very important also to have mentioned the Just Transition Fund and the achievement to have the islands as, uh, um, as uh, in, in this program uh, that will uh, benefit of, uh, on, of special funds. So it's very, very important. So um, uh, now we have the last, uh, uh, but anyway, very, very important um, a speech uh, from uh, Mr. Momot uh, uh, from DigiGrow, the responsible, of course, of, uh, of, uh, of tourism uh, that I did introduce at the beginning. Uh, Mr. Milos Momot uh, um, will talk about the tourism and transport package of uh, uh, 13 of May, short presentation from the European Commission. Uh, Mr. Momot, um, the floor is yours. Can you can hear you... me? Yes, we can don't see, but we can hear you. You will not see me, unfortunately. I just realized that there is an issue with my camera. No problem. But I hope it's not going to prevent me from presenting my points. Um, I don't have PowerPoint uh, slides to share either. I'll mm -hmm. try to quickly uh, walk you through the points that I would like to make. So thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, to this um, uh, to this event. Uh, what I would like to do is just to briefly give you an overview of what we're doing at the European Commission, what we've been doing in the context of COVID, and specifically tourist sector. Um, uh, I don't want to repeat some of the points that were made by uh, by my uh, the previous speakers. Uh, some of the points that I wanted to cover were already covered. But let me try to do the best I can uh, to, to show you what, what, what is going on at the moment uh, with our initiatives. Um, basically, since February, so since the beginning of, of COVID situation in the European Union, um, uh, we've been, uh, we've been uh, working closely with the tourist industry, but also member states on providing uh, measures that would result in providing a lifeline, preventing the companies in the tourist sector in particular, uh, from failing, from dissembling, uh, from jobs being cut. Um, uh, there were a number of measures put in place, including relaxing the rules on the state aid so that the member state could relax, uh, could um, uh, put uh, certain packages in place. Um, there were also a number of initiatives like coroner's most investment initiatives that made the structural funds that are uh, already allocated to the member state um, uh, much easier to spend with lower uh, rates of co-funding and so on. Um, we were working with the European Investment Bank and the Invest European Investment Fund to provide um, uh, guarantees and loans to the companies in distress. Um, there was also an initiative called SURE, so temporary support to mitigate unemployment risk in an emergency. Um, so 100 billion uh, basically credit line um, for member states to work with the possible unemployment. Um, so there were a number of measures that uh, that uh, gave uh, some relief to the sector because um, uh, tourist companies uh, were able to benefit from from, from uh, all of those measures. They were horizontal measures, but coming uh, reaching April and reaching end of April, it became clear that there is some additional movement on the side of member states, individual um, individual communities. Um, and also the industry that there is a time to start discussing the unfreezing of the of the activities of, of tourist sector, um, uh, start planning the summer, thinking about how to open the borders, and there were a number of different ideas uh, by different member states. Um, uh, clearly, there were some front runners uh, very keen to to open up much faster than others, um, and uh, we've heard that. Uh, not coordinating certain approach and especially um, uh, opening and recovery after crisis, especially in the tourist sector, it results in much longer time that the, than the crisis affects the, uh, the sector. So all of that um, was uh, the reason for, um, for the Commission to take actions and to propose, um, uh, to propose measure to coordinate number of elements that are necessary for reopening of, uh, of uh, European Union for tourism. Um, uh, so this initiative was also an impulse for more structured discussions 
uh, with those member states that were perhaps less keen to yet engage in, in, in certain talks and opening the borders. It's on, not only tourists, it goes beyond tourists. We're talking also about, about, uh, about um, uh, those workers that are working on two sides of the border and, and so on. So there were a number of, uh, of, um, uh, of reasons why the European Commission um, uh, decided to come up with a package uh, which we called a uh, tourism and transport package, which is a, um, a set of guidance and recommendation on how tourism travel and tourists in um, safety. I mean, there was, a, of course, an urgency factor here because uh, everyone wanted to make sure that we can put something meaningful um, uh, on the table and help member states and the industry still before the summer season. Um, summer normally is the time when the European Union uh, citizens travel. There's around 400 million tourist trips of the European residents um, just between June and August. So not to miss the time, it was it was very urgent to come up with uh, with, uh, with with um, uh, with a proposal. Um, uh, so there is um, there is a package that was prepared uh, presented on the 13th of May again to enable companies and public authorities to plan and prepare for deconfinement and also to provide reassurance to European citizens and allow them to plan their holidays. So again, rebuilding confidence and trust in traveling. Again, trying to help the industry but also destination. Most important guiding principle here is uh, that the health and safety on travels <clears throat> and people in general and all the workers uh, is, is the most essential factor. Uh, all of that is uh, with the objective to avoid the second wave of, of COVID. Also an important remark, the whole package uh, was not intended to replace the good efforts by member states, so all those front runners um, uh, on a number of issues, um, uh, but all was rather to set a framework to coordinate the gradual and safe exit from COVID um, and uh, that in terms, again, in restoring free movement of people, uh, resuming travel, and, uh, and uh, all together um, giving further confidence to tourism. So what is in this, uh, this tourism and transport package? There's any communication, uh, an overall strategy towards recovery in, uh, of tourism in 2020 and beyond. Um, some elements just to highlight is that there's a big focus on, on domestic tourism. But there's also um, uh, hints about um, how the future recovery of tourist sector should look like. So again, um, uh, looking at, um, at the ways to recover, um, uh, to have tourism more resilient, greener, and, uh, and uh, relying very much on, on, uh, on digitalization and solutions. Um, there is um, uh, further in, the, in the, the package, there's a guidance for a common approach to restoring the free movement and lifting restrictions at EU internal border uh, in a gradual and coordinated way. Um, this is based on, this is supposed to be based on objective principles, on certain health criteria that are provided by the European, um, uh, defined by European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, so the data for assessing um, uh, which countries, for instance, or which regions are meeting similar, um, uh, similar healthy standards uh, in terms of COVID would become more objective. And then the decisions to actually open up um, uh, bilaterally, even on in a group of countries, um, uh, to tourist activities between themselves will be based on something objective. Again, there are some certain principles introduced. Um, uh, we don't mind bilateral agreements between member states, but again, uh, for instance, um, the principle of, of discrimination um, uh, is very strongly accentuated in the, in the, in, in the guidelines, uh, meaning that if two countries agree to open up to, to, to each other for um, borders to, to, for, for tourism, they should not discriminate other countries that have similar um, uh, pandemic situation. Um, also, they should not um, uh, discriminate um, uh, other people living on the territory of those countries. Um, Mr. Also, Mama, those uh, guidance. Sorry, Mr. Mama, the last um, Let minute you. left, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the guidance also recalled that the free movement um, uh, of people within the European Union is, 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 is the default. So sooner or later that should be re-established. Another element of the, of the package is the framework to support the gradual re-establishment of transport 
again while ensuring safety of passengers and personnel and this 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 um, uh, set out common principles for further protocols for specific transport modes and on this basis for instance uh, further work was done by uh, the european aviation safety agency and the european center for disease prevention uh, that uh, jointly set out um, a protocol for for air travelers that came up in already in on the 20th of may um, another element of the of the of the package is the guidance on criteria for restoring tourist activities uh, and developing health protocols for hospitality establishment such as hotels um, uh, this is um, uh, this is um, some sort of um, set of common principles that should be taken on board when individual regions or member states are drawing their own specific protocols for, for different types of uh, hospital establishments. Again, to have um, certain minimum standards everywhere, that's for the, for the objective of restoring trust and, and people being able to know what they should expect when they travel somewhere else. Uh, last but not least, there is also an element, uh, there's a, a recommendation on, uh, on making travel vouchers um, uh, an attractive alternative to cash reimbursement. It is a smaller piece, but an important um, element of communication, uh, which um, aims at rebuilding travelers' confidence, restating that uh, the, the um, uh, travelers, uh, so the passengers, but also those that purchase um, uh, travel package arrangements, they have the right to be reimbursed. They don't have to accept uh, vouchers that certain companies want to offer. Uh, however, the Commission also uh, gave guidance on how to make those watches more attractive in case uh, the travelers wanted to contribute to them uh, or wanted to um, to help the companies in those um, in those specific and difficult times. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, we had um, um, one of the elements that was proposed in the in the in the package was that the EU would come up with the specific website, the platform where all the essential information that uh, are needed for people to start planning their travels and holidays would be provided. So aggregating all the information, real-time information, borders opening, travel options, applicable travel restrictions, and also um, the, um, the information about public health and safety measures in place, social distancing. Uh, this is information normally coming from the member state, but uh, but uh, the, e, um, the Commission will provide a platform that would be both um, online and, and as an application for mobile phones, where this information will be uh, very easily um, uh, available, um, uh, so that uh, everyone can have uh, quick access to information. Okay, can I travel to this and this country? On what conditions? And so on. So that would be it about the package. Uh, I wanted also to mention that there is, um, uh, on the 27th of May, um, uh, the Commission proposed a recovery fund, um, a very ambitious um, uh, fund um, that is very much oriented on helping the economy uh, to recover, but also to go into the direction of uh, greening digitalization. And this is 70, uh, 750 billion uh, fund that was proposed on top of reinforcement of the next seven years um, budget for them, uh, for them, uh, for the European Union, reinforcement to almost two, two trillion euros. There are several um, instruments proposed uh, under this proposal that will be very relevant for the tourist sector. Um, as Mr. Klemis uh, already stressed, this is a proposal it's still subject uh, to the approval of, uh, of the member mm -hmm. state. But we, we hope that it's going to come uh, smoothly and still by the end of the year we'll be able to work this. Thank you, Thank you very much, much. Mr. Momot. Uh, very broad uh, uh, anyway, representation of the package, which is very important. And uh, we invite you to send any summary or link to website that we will put as a proceeding of this uh, webinar in our website. So, so to give content because uh, not only for Europe, but the measures can be applied uh, of this package also worldwide. So it's a very good example. Thank you very much. So uh, as we are a bit late, I'd like to start um, the, the round table uh, with a very short, uh, with uh, Mrs. Cardenas uh, that has shared a, a very nice, uh, inspiring video that uh, is I'd travel? like uh, to share. Travel you. is a community. It is a collection of unparalleled experiences it is everything from breathtaking natural wonders to sensory discovery, cultural exploration to incredible encounters with incredible people. 
Travel connects us. It challenges us. It is total relaxation to pure adrenaline. It is shared time to solo adventure. Travel gives us lifelong memories and the most amazing stories to tell. We cannot travel right now. Our health and safety is paramount. But even when we have to stay apart, travel can still bring us closer. So, from homes all around the world, let's keep the spark alive together. Join us as we gather together in travel and celebrate what travel means to each of us. Share your stories, your most prized memories, or greatest adventures. Your favorite images, videos, or the songs you've heard. Inspire and help others. Fill their bucket lists and let them grow yours. Make us laugh or cry. Make our jaws drop or eyes widen. Let us support one another in this time. Keep the flame of travel burning and wanderlust alive. Because travel is a community. And that is how communities thrive. Great presentation, a great video, inspiring video to open a, a, um, a debate that I invite to be anyway, unfortunately not so long as we are late, but uh, uh, yes, uh, Ms. Cardenas, I don't know if you want to react to other speakers commenting also the video. Um, yes, so you want to break the, the ice of the debate. I break the ice, it's a pleasure. And uh, thank you all, it's been really inspiring. Um, you know, this like small video was a little bit of like to bring some. Uh, and I'm going to start playing now after three, please two, one. Ah! No, there is a. I don't know if. Please mute uh, it. Uh, I don't know from where it's coming, this music. Uh, maybe it's coming from one of the speakers. <laughs> Anyway, so very briefly, uh, I, I think, uh, yes, to ma make us dream a little bit of like the willingness to, to travel and uh, yes, to, so that we can all get inspired uh, and, uh, you know, with the future of, of travel and uh, ideas, bookings and, uh, you know, the dream to start travel. So now I wanted to, you know, our sector, as Kate said, uh, touches everyone. And so you mentioned it builds communities, it reduces poverty and uh, improves, I mean, the social impact of tourism, it's uh, extraordinary because it has an impact on every day, you know, many people's lives. So that's something I wanted to highlight. I really enjoyed uh, that. Uh, we actually speak about private public partnerships, but we also speak about private public community partnerships. It's very important in our sector to engage communities. And, and so we speak about PPCs as well. And uh, together collaboration, it's paramount. Um, Mr. Lippmann, of course, crisis has not eliminated climate change. Completely agree. This is real. This is existential. I think actually the current outbreak will help us accelerate somewhat the, the agenda we have on sustainability, probably. And I wanted to add up, and someone mentioned that as well, digitalization has come to stay. And that is something that I think will play a, a key role in, in the near future. Um, islands very important part of, of climate as George mentioned and then lastly because I want to let my other uh, um, you know uh, members of the panel uh, speak of course WTTC strongly supports the takeoff the take guidelines uh, from ICAO in fact uh, even if we have a baseline we're supporting those of course and and so we our stamp would actually be granted also to countries and destinations that adopts the ICAO uh, takeoff guidelines. So uh, yes, last but not least to the EU, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that for the first time at European level, the European Union has recognized the importance of travel and tourism as a sector, the importance it has and the impact it has on the economy, but not only on employment, as, as we mentioned before. And, uh, and so we look forward to uh, having this website up and running. It's a great idea to have a one-stop shop uh, with all these information that, again, 
the objective is to really rebuild trust and this is hopefully going to help in, in getting that in a very transparent way. So I thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, to invite also to create a debate because uh, I remember during this speech, Ms. Lipman was talking, uh, we, might, we were talking about IATA, what they are doing on sustainability as well. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Montenu uh, want to react on uh, uh, Mr. Lipman uh, invitation or <laughs> solicitation. No problem, of course I can. Uh, I'm the safety expert, but of course I'm very aware of, of environment. And even in these types of crisis, uh, I, I, I know, and its members are not running away for our uh, from our uh, environmental in fact shape uh, the future and we are continuing our work on uh, environmental uh, programs like alternative fuels like carbon offset programs of course government intervention and government support for these are uh, are extremely important in this period, we needed to focus in basically ensuring that we still have an airline industry after the crisis. But of course, we're going forward with our uh, environmental responsibilities. Yes. Ms. Lipman, are you satisfied from the answer or do you want to comment as well? <laughs> Ms. Lipman, unmute yourself, please. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm trying. Yes, you are muted. Uh, please unmute yourself. Yes. Hello? Yes. yes. Mr. No. Moon News has, has said he's not an environmental expert, so I don't want to uh, engage in a kind of um, disputation. I, I think it's just easy to say we are doing the environmental thing. And I want to give you one example of this. There are so many protocols coming out at the moment. UNWTO has issued a protocol with um, 43 subheads of activity that needs to be taken for the sector to sort of begin to, to, to restore itself. And the climate crisis response is number 42. And I think that reflects the challenge that COVID-19 has been a really something which has sort of brought everything to a halt and the responses that are coming will take the time to work through the system because every location has a different set of circumstances and travel as a minimum involves harmonization of at least to, to um, or an origin and a destination with different circumstances. And you can see how complex it is, even in the Australia, New Zealand bubble, where you have similar cultures and similar characteristics. They might both deny it, but, but you actually have those characteristics. So my concern is not so much that IATA is continuing to do its thing, there are two things which IATA, I believe, needs to take a leadership on. Number one is to change its ambition, which is currently quite conservative, to be continuing to pollute in 2050 at levels half of 2005. That's the formula. It needs to have a position that says over the next 30 years, we're going to stop polluting completely because that's part of our license to operate. Just like we're going to be safe, we're going to be secure. You get on a plane, you don't expect it to fall out of the skies. You don't expect aircraft to pollute in 30 years. Yes. And we expect the, the fossil fuel companies, they're spending millions, hundreds of millions on exploration for new fields. They need to find a synthetic aviation fuel. And small island states are totally dependent on aviation. Yes, very good, uh, Mr. Lippmann, very, and uh, Mr. Montenot, please bring this uh, message to your colleagues anyway, and uh, 
and uh, we can, we are available to facilitate, of course, and support anyway this transition. Very important, Mr. Lippen. Uh, Kate, uh, maybe a reaction from your side on what has been said today. Yeah, I think um, I was actually at a. Uh, it was a biodiversity meeting in Egypt a couple of years ago, um, and there was a tourism side event that we helped put together. And um, someone from northern, a northern European country told the small island developing states representatives that were there from the Caribbean and the Pacific that no one should be flying to their countries um, because of climate change. And it caused a really huge um, argument. And I think it kind of touches a little bit on um, what uh, Mr. Lipman is talking about. I think um, the flip side of that is that a lot of these islands, including Malta, have been really um, champions and really good at holding people's feet to the fire on these global targets on climate change um, and really recognize the, the problems um, that are uh, tied up together with not addressing it. I think there's always the elephant in the room, which is about the lack of political leadership by some countries that really need to be engaged in this for global transformation to happen. Um, and then I think the other thing I was reflecting on is if you look at places where COVID-19 has been particularly impactful, um, for example, in California, a lot of the people, there's a, quite a high death rate for Pacific Island people um, from COVID-19 due to comorbidities and um, kind of vulnerability to that, even in a place with good health care. And so I think for a lot of these places, there will be a deep concern about opening up again, even for somewhere like New Zealand, which has a very high um, number of Pacific Islanders living here. So that, you know, this is a reality that we have to face, that um, it is quite, it is quite frightening. Even in New Zealand, um, there is real concern. Um, there's a desire to also open up to the Pacific and Australia, but there's real concern that we will go backwards um, very quickly. And people are really worried about that. So what that tells me is that it's hard to see people actually traveling. It's hard to see people wanting to move. Um, so while you know, I've had a number of conversations about tourism. The reality is like even someone like me, who's basically an international traveler, I don't want to go somewhere and bring COVID-19 back to my family here, my extended family, um, all these other people. And so, you know, I worry and wonder how this reopening process is going to happen in reality um, because of that, like just, um, and kind of how people are thinking and um, may, that maybe we have, uh, we're being overly hopeful. Yes, um, thank, you. thank you, Kate. I, I think this fear is, uh, is the reality that uh, the tourism sector has to face. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, it was very important the presentation we had today where give comfort of procedures that has been token maybe is uh, not more risky than go to the supermarket anyway, because there are anyway, really some rules, uh, maybe even more than when you go to a supermarket or go out to your place. So, but uh, you got a, a, right, a very good point and uh, that uh, uh, the, our speakers need to take into account for sure. And um, uh, George, I refer to uh, the European speakers, you know, to um, uh, uh, George, uh, there is also a question for you in, in reality um, uh, that is from uh, Ms. Siliana Masson Diale. Say, Ms. Dear Mr. Kremlis, uh, you have said that in your speech that islands are specifically targeted in just a transition fund. Um, would it be possible for you to give more details on this? Thank you. I don't know if you reacting, George, you want to say yes. something? Yes, uh, thank you, Gianni. Uh, we were together in uh, Palermo during yes. uh, the, the CPMR uh, assembly. Yes. And you remember that I was uh, strongly campaigning for the Just Transition Fund to take on board the islands. As the islands uh, are vulnerable, they are isolated, they have insularity handicap, and they face at the same time 
type of problems in terms of energy transition. And the good news is now that the Just Transition Fund includes islands and therefore plans will have to be developed for the islands under the Just Transition Fund to make the islands clean energy islands. This is very important for the islands to phase out from fossil fuels as the mainland has to phase out from lignite and coal. Islands will have to do the same thing to promote renewable sources of energy, to use uh, sun, solar, uh, uh, other types of renewables, wind, tide, etc., biomass. So these are great uh, opportunities and uh, for the European Union Islands, because Just Transition Fund applies to the European Union Islands, the 27 member states, this is great news. First comment. Second comment to uh, reply to or to make a comment to Dragos Mugano. I think the European emissions trading system that applies to aviation has to be broadened. We have to broaden the scope. The scope is limited now as the emissions from aviation are the main source of air pollution. Uh, we all know that, especially because of the low cost of flights. And uh, because of COVID, uh, we have noticed that emissions have uh, uh, practically been uh, reduced. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there is road traffic, uh, there is heating, there are other sources of pollution, but aviation is also a source of pollution and uh, we need uh, to see how we can promote new types of uh, fuels, shipping as well, which is not in the ETS, this is another issue, but uh, we need to promote, uh, uh, let's say, electric boats. Uh, with Greening the Islands, we had uh, the chance to give some awards to electric boats that can connect uh, with the islands. All these are important issues that make the clear link between climate, environment, and the public uh, health, and the reasons to be optimistic about uh, the sustainable uh, tourism. And last but not least, uh, to reply to Professor Lipman, it is true that the Green Deal covers the 27 member states of the European Union. Also the target of uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 to cut the emissions that are producing, uh, let's say, are leading to, to climate change. But the European uh, Union is trying to promote the circular economy model worldwide. And this is also good news because the environment has no borders. We all know that even if we perform properly in the European Union and others in other parts of the planet do not perform properly, we will not be able, if we don't join forces, to protect the planet and the environment. So big challenges ahead, but we have the financial means, uh, we have the energy now, we have the new stance because of COVID, and I think we can be optimistic that uh, a new way of thinking and a new culture uh, will be developed uh, to promote all these important ideas. Thank you. Thank you, George. Very important, uh, anyway, your input in this answer. So I'm, uh, anyway, as the time is running, I'm putting the round table some question as well. And uh, there is one question from uh, Mr. Christian Del Bono, uh, um, the responsible of uh, the Federation of Hotels for uh, the Sicilian Islands. And uh, how can we work, uh, all work, and be part of a common strategy to raise more attention at EU level for many more islands, specific recovery and development measures. Maybe I don't know if Mr. Momot um, would like you to, to reply to this question. Anyway, common strategy is very important and maybe the EU should uh, take the lead. Um, anyway, when we talk about EU, Europe, um, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yes, absolutely. I wonder if I, I could just, just make a, a quick point here. Yeah. Just uh, let you finish, Mr. Momot, and I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Mr. Momot. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. Uh, 
first of all, okay, addressing the question, uh, common strategy for Ireland, um, uh, I'm sure that there is a space for cooperation of Ireland in the context of no recovery fund. I mean, very big amount of this money will be going uh, via the cohesion structural funds. Um, this implementation normally uh, will be decentralized. So we're talking with regions, we're talking with Ireland specifically as well. So it's on the level of the member state. But, but what is important is that there's an element of cooperation between regions that normally helps with, uh, with accessing the funds. So that I would imagine that now is the time to sitting together, islands together and discussing how to, for instance, um, agree on specific investment uh, that should be rolled out in coordinated manner across different, um, different islands. So a common team and all of that with the, with, the, with the overall objective of the recovery fund. Again, it will be greening, uh, again, it will be digitalization, um, uh, helping, of course, from uh, getting out of the COVID situation. So, so de facto, I think it's a no-brainer for uh, hearing for, from uh, what was said in this in the seminar. And um, this is this is the areas that the islands want to cooperate in. Um, I wanted to also take a moment just to address um, and, um, uh, or thank to actually uh, Miss um, uh, Miss Cardenas from WTDC. Uh, for for um, applauding that we are actually giving more attention to tourists these days. And I just wanted to, to, to make sure that we don't misunderstand it and each other. I mean, tourists has always been very high on the agenda of the European Union. Um, there's always quite substantial amounts of funding was going to, to tourists, uh, except that it perhaps was not specifically visible because it was going via um, different programs. Now seeing those, those big figures, seeing separate strategy, um, uh, that uh, that um, uh, might appear that okay we changing the approach. You know, tourism is important, but very much it's still horizontal activity. This is something very much connected with other ecosystems, and this is how we want to see it. Um, last point, I just wanted to make a general comment, very very short one. I'm very much pleased to see that uh, basically every speaker was was very adamant that this is a good opportunity now with with with, uh, with um, the COVID crisis unfortunate crisis but however um, uh, something that may prompt changes and that, that there is an alignment of, of, of thinking that it's a good moment to reflect how tourists should be looking like in the perspective of, uh, of the next years and the long term as well. It's clear that it's time for change. Uh, personally I think that COVID uh, and uh, that the current stop of activities is a good moment when relaunching to relaunch in a different spirit. Uh, and that will uh, be uh, linking to everything, aviation, it will link to the tourist pattern, it will link to, um, uh, to how, um, what forms of transportation uh, we take, uh, what, what behaviors we have when travel. But I think it's a good moment to, 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 to actually change behavior of individual tourists, but also of the companies in the same. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very good input. Uh, uh, we have uh, Mr. Lippen, we have Mr. Uh, Asunitis uh, need to react, but if you have something very, very short um, w you wanted to say. Be, yeah, uh, yeah. I, it, it is, uh, I can be very brief. I think it was in response to the question about should there be a common strategy for islands. I believe, as a person who's been around for quite a long time, that at this moment we are very fortunate that we have EU leadership on a global scale on the direction to go. Uh, because the United States, which has been the traditional leader, has totally abrogated its responsibilities in this respect. And I think the Green New Deal um, contains, and together with the, the sort of climate laws that are being evolved, this represents the right direction for the future. It ties us in to the SDGs, it ties us into the circular economy, to nature-based solutions. If you read the Green New Deal, it covers all of the elements and it, it includes the, the development of legislation over time to reduce carbon pollution levels. So I, I just wanted to put in a, a word as an analyst that yes. this is the strategy that we should be following. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, George Asadnitis from Insular, uh, last comment from your side. George? 
Gianni, thank you. Uh, we are a little bit late. You know, this we yes. have another meeting now. You are the uh, last. Letting me me uh, messages. But anyway, I mean, uh, uh, first of all, islands are not victims of the climate change uh, because islands do, do not generate it. So they are the victims, in fact. Um, another point is the mass tourism. Uh, that is a, a model, uh, existing model in Mediterranean islands. How is possible to transform it to, to a model of sustainable, sustainable uh, tourism? Uh, large investment can be done in islands. I don't know what to do with, I mean, uh, big hotels, large hotels, all these kind of things. This is my, my, my two comments. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, to conclude this uh, wonderful uh, uh, debate and uh, uh, anyway uh, um, uh, panel discussion etc uh, I'd like to highlight uh, a comment that arrived from uh, Mrs. Uh, Savior Greg Obbo the Gods of GNO um, G uh, NGO Association is saying the actors in the touristic sector should be more proactive to synergies with the culture sector and um, we take this point for Green the Islands that we will try to connect all the actors anyway and uh, and we have done today and uh, I hope that this panel will be a sort of com committee for the future to cooperate for a, a better uh, and a faster restart, uh, restart as Ms. Cardena said at the beginning and cooperation is very important. I take this word at the end um, to conclude this uh, wonderful session. Thank you very much for all speakers for the great input. All the presentation will be in the pages of the web uh, of the webinar in our um, uh, greentheisland.net website. And um, uh, thank you for the attendees. Uh, and uh, we will go through all the other questions and debate, and uh, we'll try it also to answer to other points that we can find out in the chat. Thank you very much. Have a good day, and thank you for your attention. Bye. Thank you, Gianni. Thank you. Speak to you soon. Thank you very much.